Sorry about that. You're all set to begin. Okay. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, we hope everyone as well. We thank you all um, for joining um, joining us. My name is Nkosi Lee. I'm the uh, ch um, chair of the um, Spirit Council Event Subcommittee, and we're just here with the Event Subcommittee. Um, we're doing our monthly discussion of Simsbury Let's Talk, and this is just our our virtual discussion. You know, obviously with the with the aim of trying to increase, you know, the um, diversity, inclusion, you know, in the town of Simsbury and surrounding areas. And so, you know, it is our, our goal to provide um, discussion topics um, that, you know, often just are outside of the, the realm of our everyday conversation um, topics. And so we continue, you know, in that avenue with tonight, and this is our Black History Month conversation. And so we're able to um, present a discussion on the um, Amistad. And so we're um, very thankful for our um, guests that are here with us this evening. And so we just say um, thank you for um, your presence. We have um, Chris from Discovering Amistad, um, Chris Menapace from Discovering Amistad, and Dr. Ned Edwards, also the history of uh, and ethics from the Ethel um, Walker School. And so they're both here to lend you know, their expertise on the topic. And I do believe that's always, uh, you know, a strength of our conversations is the fact that um, our panelists who do take the time out of their own schedule to join us and just to offer, you know, a part, you know, to, to educate, um, to inform and to enlighten, you know, the audience and the um, topics of our, you know, that we have on a, on a monthly basis. You know, so I said tonight we're discussing, you know, the Amistad and the um, the mutiny, um, the revolt, the revolt or the rebellion, however you want to, to frame it. And as well, how the um, Connecticut Farmington community responded, you know, um, to the to the need that was made available. And so both of the um, our speakers tonight are going to, um, you know, be able to give a, a great um, piece of presentation and information on that topic. So we're just thankful for everyone this evening that is able to join us and hopefully, you know, just to listen and to learn. Um, you know, we're always open for questions. So please, if you can, um, you could do a raise hand feature on your, um, uh, on your, um, the box there, or if you want to type in the message, that's also um, available as well. But we are thankful, you know, on behalf of the Spirit Council, that Simsbury problem, identification and recognition of issues together, and on behalf also in partnership with the Simsbury Public Library, who continues to offer their resources for us to, um, for the platform for us to have these discussions. So that being said, we say thank you all for joining us, audience and panelists. And so now let's um, get into the, go towards the meat and the potatoes, you know, of this night. I'm excited. I'm always, you know, uh, excited about our discussions just because I know they are so fruitful. So that being said, um, we're going to start with um, uh, uh, allow Chris Menapace to introduce himself and tell us a little bit about, you know, who he is and what he does. And then followed, we're going to hear from Dr. Ned Edwards and um, being um, able to do the exact same thing. So Chris, um, um, thank you for joining us. All right, thank you for having me, Nikosi. So uh, as Nikosi mentioned, I am Chris Menapace. I'm the senior educator at Discovering Amistad. We own and operate what we call our floating classroom, which is the recreation um, Amistad vessel that I'll talk more about uh, a little bit later. But as an educator, I'm very visual. Uh, so I brought a PowerPoint with me to just highlight uh, the story of the Amistad in a more visual way. Actually, I have shared in the wrong way. I wanna make sure I share sound. Go. All right, so what I'm basically presenting to you is like a shortened version so, of- our Chris, if you don't mind, Chris, is before you get started, just allow um, Dr. Edwards just a chance to introduce himself. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. We'll go into the presentation. Not a problem, but thank you. 
No, quite all right. Uh, I'm Ned Edwards. I'm uh, currently a, a teacher and program director at the Ethel Walker School. It was my great privilege to be the senior minister of the Congregational Church in Farmington for 16 years. Um, the, the Farmington Church has a, a distinguished history um, with Amistad and the, and the story, which I'll get into tonight. But because of that relationship and because of my leadership there, I had the great pleasure of um, being a part of the, the movement to build the ship, um, had the, the pleasure of, of being on the ship for the first few weeks of its um, maiden voyage, and uh, have been telling the story of, of the Farmington aspect of the Amistad for many years. So it's my pleasure to be here, and it's a real pleasure to be with, uh, with Chris and with Ngozi and uh, with all of you tonight. And I'm looking forward to learning from Ned as well uh, when he talks about his section because that was a little bit before my time, you know, 20 years ago now, uh, more than 20 years ago now. Uh, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to his section as well. All right. You might see a cattail swing by. They have uh, they know when I'm talking to people and that's when they pop in. Um, but I want to give us a little bit of background, give us the story of the Amistad. And we talked about farming, we talked about Connecticut. The story of the Amistad begins with the Africans, who were the central players in that story. And their story begins in West Africa, what we would call Sierra Leone today. Most, not all, but most of the people that would end up on the vessel Amistad were Mende Africans. Mende is an ethnic group, a culture, as well as a language. In fact, there are millions of Mende people in West Africa today, mainly in Sierra Leone. So life in the 1830s in West Africa, I'm just gonna show you a few images of them, uh, just to give you some background um, of what was their life was like before any of this was happening. So the Mende Africans came from many different backgrounds. There were a number of blacksmiths, among the group, as well as rice farmers, soldiers, leaders, um, many different merchants, many different backgrounds to them. And, you know, when you picture West Africa in the 1830s, you might not be picturing it uh, in a more European sense, but in reality, West Africa then and now is one of the most populated and diverse areas in the entire world. You could go two towns over then and now, and they'd be speaking a completely different language because there's so many different ethnic groups. Um, and so trade was very vibrant. You see this little marketplace here, trading of uh, food and merchant goods. And you actually see different structures here, uh, African and European structures showing that trade was vibrant in West Africa with European and American merchants beyond that of slavery. It's not something that a lot of people talk about. For example, you see this European umbrella with this woman in front. European products are very prized in uh, West Africa. And uh, West Africans were very much looked at as quality rice farmers as well. And so because of how diverse and how much you know, mercantilism was happening, they would have a cultural process called a palaver. This was a meeting between two groups of people without a shared language or culture. And this was very instrumental to the background of the Mende Africans because they would have to be doing that throughout this story, even with their ch each other. Mende was the most common language among them, but not everyone of the, of the Amistad Africans were Mende. And they also had something else called the Poro Society, which I'll begin to talk about a little bit more later. But in essence, it was a it, it is and was a secret society uh, of male leaders. And there's actually it still exists today, as well as its female equivalent, the Sande Society. I was in Cincinnati last year, and they had a really great collection of Sande uh, masks, an art masks that they make. They're very prized for that. 
And unfortunately, when we talk about West Africa in the 19th century and beyond that, we need to talk about slavery. It was unfortunately a very common thing uh, occurring in this time. And the main thing I wanna highlight in this section is the processes of dehumanization that the kidnapped Africans would undergo. One thing of note in 1839, uh, when this story begins, the international slave trade is illegal. Internet or countries across the world, the United States included, have agreed to outlaw the slave trade. That does not mean slavery was over, just the slave trade. By 1839, I believe the only major country in uh, the Western world to abolish slavery was England, and they had just done it. So after being kidnapped, um, the thousands and of course millions through time Africans would be put into something called coffle. Coffle is defined as a line of animals, prisoners, or enslaved, chained and driven along together. You can see this imagery here that I try to highlight the similarities between the coffle on the top and the coffle at the bottom. And you see men, women, and children in this coffle being marched towards the coastline where they'd be sold to slave ships. Another process of dehumanization, this process of taking the humanity away from somebody was something that sounds pretty innocuous, which is a health inspection. In reality, many of the Amistad Africans specifically mention this as one of the most dehumanizing parts of their experiences where the slave traders would look at their hair, their eyes, their teeth, height, weight, and age, all of these things to determine how much this person, this individual was worth as a piece of property. So this is where the price was given to that individual. Um, and really, again, taking away that humanity to be treated as an object. From there, they were brought to a place called Limboko. Now, I don't know if anyone here has seen the movie before, but you'll see it one or two images from the movie. On, the image on the left is an image from the Amistad movie by Steven Spielberg depicting a real place called Limboko. Limboko no longer exists, um, but was a slave trading hub where thousands, millions over time, Africans were brought to from the interior of Africa. Um, this place was run by that man in the white suit in the front called Pedro Blanco, a Spaniard. And he um, you know, ran this operation to illegally sell these hundreds of thousands of kidnapped Africans. So thinking of the Amistad Africans, the people who eventually make their way to the Amistad, the Africans here, about 500 of them, will be sold to a Portuguese slave ship called the Tacora. So before they're ever on the Amistad, they are on a Portuguese slave ship called the Tacora. Now you may have seen an image like this before um, where it shows the really compact uh, compartments that the slave ship would have. And I want to make a distinction of what a slave ship is versus what the Amistad is. A slave ship was made for the specific purpose of transporting kidnapped human beings. A slave ship could carry five, 600 kidnapped Africans on board. And if you look on this image, you'll see hundreds of people, shoulder to shoulder, head to toe, uh, hands, neck, and feet sometimes chained, and chained in a line together. Um, and you imagine the world of COVID, how deadly these conditions would be. You know, there's no sanitation here. Um, they're spending probably 20, 22 hours a day in these conditions. So almost the entire day uh, like this, you know, the pandemic of its time was smallpox and think of how deadly these conditions were. There are millions of victims of the slave trade and millions of them did not survive what was called the Middle Passage. So the Tekora 
soot sailed from Limboco and was going to Havana, Cuba. So those 500 Africans in, on the Decora spent weeks in those conditions. And I want to show you a little interactive map. Does anyone see the, the new page here? Yes. Sometimes it doesn't do it. So I just want to quickly show this. So you get an idea of the scale of the slave trade. Each one of these dots represents a slave ship. The larger the dot, the more kidnapped Africans were on board. The color of the dot represents the country of origin of the ship. I'm gonna skip forward a little bit closer. We're in 1839 in our story and you can see just how many ships there are every year. And it's around 1810 that the slave trade is illegal as you can see, it does not stop. And in fact, it will start to pick up in just a moment. Um, when we get to 1839, one of these green dots leaving Sierra Leone going to Cuba will be the Tacora. And you see, it doesn't really stop until slavery stops. So the demand is still there for the white enslaved. Now in Cuba, the 500 Africans on board the Decor are loaded onto the shore to be sold to different plantation owners. 53 of those 500 Africans were sold to two men, Jose Ruiz and Pedro Montes. Of these 53 Africans, 49 are adult men and four of them are children. They are then put on board the Amistad. And I mentioned this difference, right, between a slave ship and the Amistad. The Amistad, which is, that's an image of our modern day recreation of the Amistad, much smaller than a slave ship. If you've ever been to Mystic Seaport and you see their whaling ship, that's about the size roughly of what a slave ship like the Tacora was, much bigger. The Amistad was really a coastal cargo ship. It was made to transport goods from one part of the island to the other. And it could, those goods could be tools, food, medicine, clothing, or enslaved people. And this was not the first time the Amistad had to transport enslaved people. My question for you, if anyone here knows Spanish, does anyone know what Amistad translates to in English? I'll give a second to see if anyone mentions it in chat. So the ironic name, Amistad, is the Spanish word for friendship. Hmm. And someone, uh, someone got you know pretty much in chat, right, as I was saying. So it's friendship, not a very fitting name for the reality of what the Amistad was doing. And, you know, we give this program to lots of cities and, you know, you have a lot of Spanish speakers and they'll chuckle when I'll say the Amistad because it just doesn't make sense. And I want to talk about another aspect of dehumanization that's being done to these Africans. We talked about health inspections, coffles, but also separation of family. And this could happen at any point. I mentioned 53 kidnapped Africans on the Amistad and 49 men, four children. Um, those 49 men, they're not with their wives, they're not with their children. Those four children are not with their siblings, not with their parents. Uh, and I think only one or two are with like uh, a brother or sister, but pretty much nobody is with their family. And even if they had been kidnapped with family members, they could be sold off to a different plantation. Even if they created a new family on that plantation, they could be sold away at any time. I usually use the example of Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass grew up on a plantation in Maryland. Uh, his father was his enslaver. And he, when he was a child, I believe a teenager, he was sold away from his mother and his siblings uh, to another enslaver. And I don't believe he ever saw his mother again. And so this was very much a reality of enslavement. And I'll talk about the Amistad Africans um, 
eventually, you know, if they're able to reconnect with family members, but it was a very dehumanizing experience. I want to take a quick pause to see if there are any questions in chat. Again, feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, use chat or as Nikosi mentioned, the, the hand raise um, feature. So now the Amistad Africans are loaded on board uh, the Amistad themselves, the namesake and kind of the, the name of this overall rebellion and program and historic events. On board the Amistad are, of course, the captain, Ramon Fair. He has his own enslaved person, Antonio, 14-year-old boy. The crew, Jacinto, Manuel, and Celestino, the two enslavers, Jose Ruiz and Pedro Montes, who had purchased the 53 Africans, and of course, the 53 illegally kidnapped Africans. And these drawings you see on the right are actual drawings of the Amistad Africans. Uh, they were taken while they were imprisoned in Connecticut. So these are the actual drawings and what they look like. You know, I'll point out a few, but uh, Kale, who will mention Fuli, who uh, I believe is the one buried in Farmington. Uh, Kimbo, Margu, um, a number of people, it's not all of them, of course, um, but there were 53 in total. And I want to highlight one person in particular, Sangbe Pia. You may have heard the name Joseph Cinque, and that was his Spanishized name. And I'll talk about why they, that name even exists. But Sangbe Pia uh, was Mende. He was a father, a husband, a farmer, a businessman, and a member of that Poro society that I mentioned earlier. This was this secret society of leaders that held religious ceremonies, maintained justice, and provided for defense. The reason I point this out is that Sangbe will be the leader of the Amistad Africans, and they look to him specifically because of his leadership experience back in West Africa. He was actually not the only member of the Poro Society on the Amistad, but he, um, as you'll see soon, he really led uh, the Africans. Now, the Amistad was supposed to sail from Havana, Cuba to Puerto Principe. That was supposed to take about three days. On the first night, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but in Puerto Principe were sugarcane plantations. I don't know how much people know about sugarcane. If you know anything about you know, American slavery, it's all about cotton, tobacco, things like that. In the Caribbean, it was sugar. And if you lived in 1839 and you ate or bought something with sugar, it is coming from the slave labor of these Caribbean plantations. And that's something I like to ask people, what can we think of it's like that today. <laughs> cell phone. What can we think of that's like these sugar cones? Or would you say, Nikosi? That's cell phones. Cell phones, right? Made in sweatshops in East Asia or Central America. Do the, do the mining for the the minerals in Africa and, and A lot of diamonds, right? Oh. And so, when more you look at history, you kind of see these such stark similarities where you know, it was so hard to get away from slavery. Even if you lived in a state like Ohio that didn't have slavery, if you bought sugar, well, you're handing money to an enslaver. You are still involved in this system of slavery. And of course, right, or, uh, sugar is one of many examples, right? If you had a cotton shirt, um, came from somewhere, the factories that you might be employed of in Connecticut that made cotton shirts textiles, it's coming from somewhere. So this is try something I try to emphasize is this connection. Even if you did not own an enslaved person in 1839, you were connected to slavery in some way. Well, the Amistad Africans never make it to these sugarcane plantations. The first night on the Amistad, Sangbe PA finds a loose nail, is able to pick the lock on his chain. From there, he's able to free 
all 53 of the Amistad Africans. They're in the cargo hold, the crew's above decks. So they haven't been found out. Before they just launch a rebellion, uh, they sit down and they talk and they think out, how are we going to do this? So this wasn't some spur of the moment, we're free, now let's go take the ship. It was a meticulously planned out event. For one, um, they thought, well, the crew of the ship has guns. What are we going to do? Well, if you're familiar with sugarcane plantations at all, sugarcane grows like bamboo. And to cut it down back then, you had a sugarcane knife, which was basically a machete. Well, the Amistad captain thought he was smart. I was like, I'll, you know, I'll transport these uh, enslaved people to the sugarcane plantations, and I'll sell them some knives, some sugarcane knives. Well, he left that in the cargo hold next to the kidnapped Africans. So the kidnapped Africans armed themselves with these sugarcane knives. And, you know, it was nighttime, so let's, let's launch our attack now. And we're able to take control of the vessel. Uh, not without violence, as you can see by this famous portrait of the Amistad Rebellion. Many of the Africans had, were veterans of conflict, uh, and, like Sangbei. And so armed with these sugarcane knives, it was actually the captain of the ship, Ramon Fair, that opened fire on the Africans first. The Africans, with superior numbers in close quarters, were able to take over the ship in about five minutes. They killed the captain and they killed one of the crew. As you can see in the background, two of the crew escape over a rowboat uh, over the side. They uh, keep Ruiz and Montez alive. Why do you think they kept Ruiz and Montez alive? Why would they keep their enslavers around? Somebody's gotta steer the boat. Somebody's gotta sail. The uh, Mende land at that point was very interior. It was not really a coastal place. None of the Amistad Africans were sailors, and they were smart enough to know what they didn't know, and that was sailing. So they kept Ruiz and Montez alive to sail them back to West Africa. So Sangbe had noticed on the Takora that they were sailing away from the rising sun. So he knew they were going west the whole time on the ocean. So he instructed Ruiz and Montez head towards the rising sun, head east, back to West Africa. So during the day, Ruiz and Montez sailed the boat east. But at night, they turned it back west. So it leads to this weird zigzag up the east coast of the United States to Connecticut. So you're probably wondering, how did this ship end up in Connecticut? And that's how. Took about six weeks. Um, some of the Africans died in the rebellion. Some of them died of dehydration or hunger on the ship itself. So I think there's about 38, um, maybe 40 by the time they reach Long Island Sound. In Long Island Sound, the Amistad is captured by the US Navy. Um, and what might not be surprising uh, to all of you is they they free Ruiz and Montez and they imprison the Amistad Africans. In fact, Connecticut, um, they were actually off of Long Island. So they were actually in New York when this happened. But the captain of the ship, salvage laws were very different back then. Captain of the ship knew that he might get the salvage of all the ship and its property if he brought it to a slave state like Connecticut, which still had slaves in 1839 he might get the actual enslaved people themselves as they were considered property. So they tow the ship to New London, imprison the Africans in New Haven. And this is where that kind of next leg of the story begins, uh, this court case system. So if you've ever seen the movie, I think it's right around, uh, they started the rebellion, but really concentrate on the court cases. Let me get a little bit into the court cases. And my question for you, why do you think uh, Montez and Ruiz lied about where the Amistad Africans were from? Because, of course, Montez and Ruiz didn't say, hey, we have these illegally kidnapped Africans. They go to the authorities and they say, these are Cubans. See that man? His name is Joseph Cinque. So they 
Spanishizers' names. That's why Sangbei PA is called Joseph Sangbei. They have these fake documents saying that they were, you know, Cuban enslaved Africans, not African born, because again, the slave trade is illegal, but slavery is not. So it's at this point the Amistad Africans have to strategize how are we going to win our freedom again? Because they've already won it once and then they were imprisoned again. They think about recruiting allies. And those allies were abolitionists. Uh, some examples were Dwight James and Lewis Tapping. Dwight James was the first man on the scene actually was able to see the ship come into New London. Lewis Tapping was kind of the money of the operation where he was able to use his wealth to hire a lawyer for the Amistad Africans and publicize the story uh, of their plight in newspapers around the country. This was really a national news story. Has anyone here been to the old state house? See a few nodding heads. Um, how do they know they had allies in the US? A good question, because there's this language barrier, and I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but it, we can really say it was thanks to Dwight James. Dwight James, when he sees this ship, he actually is able to get on board and very quickly sees what's happening. And this, these are clearly Africans who have been illegally kidnapped. So he really notifies the abolitionists uh, in Connecticut and gets them to rally around and meets with the um, meets with the Amistad Africans. So he's really the one that connects everybody together. But if you've ever been to the old state house in Hartford, Connecticut, it is where the some of the Connecticut trials were uh, happened. And in fact, the room is still uh, mostly preserved today. So you can actually go in the room where these next trials occurred. But the question of the court cases comes down to one simple thing. Where are these black men and children from? Are they from Africa or are they from Cuba? If they're from Africa, they've been illegally kidnapped. If they're from Cuba, and they've been legally enslaved. So as I'm sure if you ever study any court case, there's so many levels you have to go through um, for this. So, you know, you got to start with districts, courts, federal circuit courts, so on and so forth. Uh, so Connecticut is where those first trials took place. And of course, there's actually multiple trials charging different things. But the simple fact is they're trying to figure out where the Amistad Africans this is a movie depiction of that scene, but there's a language barrier. The Amistad Africans actually spoke many languages amongst themselves, but English was not one of them. And the lawyers and the judges do not speak Mende. So they have to come up with a way to break this language barrier. And the um, abolitionists and the Africans enlist a man named Josiah Willard Gibbs. He was a linguist professor at Yale, and he was, the Africans were able to teach him how to count from one to 10 in Mende. He and some colleagues then go to the docks of New York City and begin to shout from one to 10 in Mende. Eventually, a man comes up to them uh, named James Covey and asks, you know, why are you speaking my language? What's going on? He has a pretty interesting story himself. Kobe is Mende, so the same background as most of the Amistad Africans. He, of course, speaks Mende, he speaks English, and he, his story was very similar to the Amistad Africans. He had been kidnapped from his home in West Africa, put on a slave ship, endured the Middle Passage, but unlike the Takora that successfully made it to Cuba, the slave ship that he was on was captured by a British anti-slave patrol ship because the British were actually sending out ships to stop the slave trade. So James Covey is rescued by that slave ship, joins the British Navy in the fight against the slave trade. So that's how he knows English, that's how he knows Mende, and his ship, the HMS Buzzard, is docked in New York City. So he's already down for the cause of fighting against slavery, so he readily agrees to be the translator for the Africans and the abolitionists. And now in these court cases, 
Sangbe, Grabo, Fuli, all of these people can speak through a translator contradicting the stories of Ruiz and Montez, saying, you know, I am from Mende land, I am not from Cuba, my real name is Sangbe PA, things like that. And they actually win the Connecticut trials uh, pretty soon after that court case. But politics gets involved. You know, it's not uh, just the letter of the law sometimes. President Martin Van Buren is getting pressure from the Spanish government, from Southern plantation owners, and Van Buren's also up for re-election. And he knows that if he allows the Amistad Africans to go free, it will hurt his chances to win the Southern Democratic voting bloc. So he, instructs his attorney general to take this case to the Supreme Court. Um, if there was time, I'd show you a video. I know I don't want to eat up on uh, Dr. Edwards time, but uh, a really cool scene. No, I'm going to show it because it's only like 30 seconds. I'm going to show it. <laughs> Ned's nodding yet. Do it. <laughs> Were they born in Africa? So this is the movie depiction of actually the Connecticut trial, but I use it with the students for the Supreme Court trial because it's the same verdict. So this is the movie depiction in a much more dramatic way than I can say the uh, what the courts decided. But this is the movie depiction of the final case of this Amistad versus the United States. Were they born in Africa? I believe they were. As such, Her Catholic Majesty's claims of ownership have no merit. Neither, of course, do those for salvage made by Lieutenants Meade and Gedney. I hereby order the immediate arrest and detention of Signors Ruiz and Montez. <laughs> on the charge of slave treating! So yeah, that's the very dramatic movie version of events. It gets the main points right, a few things wrong, I'll point that out, but in the end, um, the Amistad Africans win seven to one uh, their Supreme Court case. The Supreme Court rules that these are clearly Native, of Afri Native Africans who have been illegally kidnapped and must be allowed their freedom and the ability to return home. Now, Ruiz and Montez, don't go in prison. They they weren't even there for the final trial. They were in Cuba and Spain doesn't extradite them. Uh, but the main point is that the Africans do win their Supreme Court case, uh, seven to one. And one of the things I like to point out to my students, just look at the Supreme Court. What do you notice about this Supreme Court? First of all, there's only eight. One of, one of the nine justices had, is in the process of being replaced because he had just died. Uh, so there's only eight, but other than that, It's all, all white men. All white men and multiple members of the Supreme Court were enslavers themselves. Slavers. So it was a pretty shocking uh, ruling for the country. They were not expecting the Supreme Court to rule in favor of the Amistad Africans because of all of this bias going in there. It, it was a rare victory. It's really the first victory for the abolitionists on a national level. But it is a victory. But I noticed, I used my words very carefully. It allowed them to go home. It did not give them the means to go home. And I, I'm sure uh, Dr. Edwards will talk about this a lot more, but they needed to, the Africans, the 35 surviving Africans needed to raise money to go home. Court didn't give them a penny, didn't give them the ship, nothing. So they actually had to stay, I think it was another uh, eight, nine months in Connecticut 
raising the money for their return home. But in 1842, so a full three years after the initial kidnapping, the Amistad Africans will board the gentleman, the ship, back to West Africa. Of course, that is not the end of their story. Um, Doctors will talk a little bit more uh, about the church's role in all of this. But a quick few things that are happening here is one, uh, this is really when their freedom is returned because even living in Connecticut, they had to follow the rules and customs of the country and were not treated as equals. So really returning to West Africa is when they can rehumanize after all of these dehumanizing things have happened to them. Some of them are able to return home to their families. Berna, one of the Amistad Africans, finds his mother and is then able to reconnect with his wife and children. Sangbe, on the other hand, unfortunately, returns to his village and finds it destroyed. His family most likely victims of the slave trade itself. So some people are able to have happier endings than others. Sangbe, uh, did start a new family. His descendants still live today, some of them um, in the United States, and some of them actually came out to the ship when it was being built. And uh, last thing I want to mention are some of these long-reaching impacts of the Amistad. As I mentioned, this was kind of the first big victory for the abolitionists. 1839, the abolitionists were not a huge movement. And so this really internationally famous story, they've won. They've won, and of course, the Africans uh, have really won it, but when it comes to the impacts in the United States, this leads to a lot of growth and uh, influence to the abolitionist movement. Although it would take another, you know, I'm doing math very poorly in my head, but it would take, take until 1865 to slavery really end in the United States. 22 years. 22 years, thank you. I, my degree is not in math, it is in history. So, And uh, one of the really cool direct impacts it has is another rebellion that mirrors the Amistad almost exactly. So when the Amistad Africans are touring across the Northern United States to raise money for the return home, they are in Philadelphia at one point. And another man, uh, is in Philadelphia, who had just escaped slavery in the South. Um, I remember his last name was Washington. I'm now blanking on his first name, but he had just escaped Southern slavery. He goes to Philadelphia to enlist the help of the abolitionists in going back and rescuing his wife. They say, no, you're just going to be kidnapped again. Um, it's a fool's errand. He goes back anyway. He is kidnapped again. He is put on a domestic slave ship called the Creole, uh, where it's just transporting from one southern slave state to another. Well, when he was in Philadelphia, he had heard all about the Amistad and actually had witnessed this very famous portrait of Sang that I showed earlier and was very moved by the Amistad story and their successful rebellion. On board the Creole, he decides to launch his own rebellion. He actually is able to succeed, and unbeknownst to him, his wife is actually enslaved on the same ship. So he's actually able to rescue his wife as well. And this is 1841, right at the same time this is all happening. So he's very motivated and influenced by this Amistad story. So I've done enough talking for right now. I, of course, have lots more I could say, but I want to open it up uh, to some questions. Right. I would say, you know, Chris, thank you for, you know, such an in-depth um, presentation on the Amistad. I know you say, you say you could go, you know, a lot further into it. I think there's a, a few things that stand out, you know, to me. And I think, you know, one part, well, actually there's a few, but the, um, I think that the, the listing that you have of Singbei, Sing Singpei, as a um, Singbei, yep, as a father, um, a husband, you know, a farmer, a businessman, and, you know, the member of the um, Poro Society as well. 
And then, you know, again, that's part of that, you know, the, the human side of who he is and how the dehumanization, you know, that occurred in the slave trade, you know, and everything else that goes along with it, that these, you know, the story of who, you know, who the story of, of, of the person that has been taken captive, you know, they're not just a, a slave, but there is much more of a story, you know, to the individual. You know, and that's something you showed, you know, the pictures of the blacksmiths and things. You talked about rice farming and to understand that these were um, individuals that had specialized, you know, um, skills and that there were, um, and for some cases, taken from particular regions for particular um, labor, you know, in the Americas. But that was one part, you know, about your presentation that did um, stand out to me. It's just like the personification of the human, you know, allowing, given the human qualities. I think even, you know, that that's something that gets um, sometimes taken for granted by imagery. And that's even in today's society, you know, for a lot of, you know, particular um, Black men and men of color, we lose a lot of the, just our, the humanity of it, the personification. But I don't know if that's something you could speak on briefly, you know, in, in this whole story. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for uh, mentioning that. It's something I we definitely try to do on purpose because, unfortunately, the way slavery is taught on a lot of times, and just really the way people talk about slavery, for a lot of younger kids, like middle and elementary school especially, black and slave becomes the same word for them. Right. So even talking about free black people in the United States, they'll still say free slaves. It's like, well, they were never slaves. They were never enslaved in their entire life, if, you know, just mentioning a specific person, you know, and so I try to use in, enslaved for that very reason, because it's a condition being put upon them rather than a title. And Nicosia, as you mentioned, give this background to give a fuller picture of someone rather than just the condition they're being put in, because any enslaved person was more than just that. As you mentioned with Sangbei, you know, father, farmer, leader, husband, uh, all of these different things. And, you know, it's the skills that these kidnapped Africans brought to the table to help them win this battle. You know, from the rebellion itself, Sangbei's leadership abilities, the veterans that were on board that ship who knew how to fight, um, all of these different things, really, uh, these skills that they brought were able to win them their freedom again. That's all right. And we have a, 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 a other question here. And I just wanted to say one more thing. When you showed the clip of the judge and how he says, um, were they from Africa? And he says, I believe they were. And you see how like, everyone's eyes shifted up. And, and I, I smile, but it's the same feeling, like that same on your edge feeling that you have like any time someone is on trial, you know, and oh, am I? Okay, someone is on, on trial. And so I was thinking of that, whether, you know, it's the George Floyd case, it's Ahmad um, Arbery, you, there's that on edge feeling. And it was when I saw that clip, I was like, man, a hundred, you know, you know, nearly 200 years later, there's that still same on your edge feeling that any time, you know, the, the, uh, a trial regarding, you know, type of discrimination, in this case is slavery or, or the police brutality, anything that challenges the law almost, there's still that same on your edge because you're not expecting almost uh, uh, the, what you might see as the obvious verdict. And then when it does happen, it's more surprise. And it's still, you still have the exact same reaction that there's still more surprise than not. And so hopefully that is something that can and will you know, continue to change, but as it is right now, there's still, you can still see that on your edge. You know, yeah, so and this same noise. Supreme Court, you know, 10 years, 11 years later, ruled the Dred Scott decision, yep. you know, taking away the voting rights for free Blacks in certain states like Massachusetts. So, you know, one of the things I do on some of the longer programming for the students, especially when we talk about Supreme Court cases, Auto, we want to mention the ones that have helped freedom, helped civil rights, and hurt civil rights. I mean, a lot of these Supreme Court decisions we look at as great decisions that help people are overturning old decisions that hurt people. You know, um, I see a couple questions in chat. 
Yeah, that's exactly. Uh, the one dissenting Supreme Court justice, I don't remember his name off the top of my head, but uh, back then you didn't always write a dissenting opinion, and he specifically did not, so we don't really know his full reasoning. Right. But the Attorney General of the United States was trying to argue that some trade treaty with Spain overruled this ban on the slave trade. It wasn't a very good reasoning, as it, you know, seven to one in Supreme Court terms is is a very overwhelming victory. I think the um, guy the guy who dissented, his name was Baldwin. Okay, could have been more than one Baldwin because Baldwin was also the lawyer for the Africans, but Baldwin's very common name, so there could be more than one Baldwin. Um, I see another one. Was the president still in the hot seat with Spain and the Southern states? Well, he didn't win re-election. Uh, Van Buren was a one-term president. I don't remember who won over him, though. Did they all go back? So the 35 surviving Africans, all of them returned to West Africa. One did come back um, uh, temporarily, Sarah Margrew, uh, and she went to Oberlin College and then returned to West Africa. She was one of the children, so uh, I'm sure Dr. Edwards will talk more about her. The passage across the ocean was terribly claustrophobic. Did they get any exercise, any opportunity to stretch and turn over a bed? So one thing I'll mention is no beds. You're just laying there on planks. They would actually get some fresh air um, you know, the enslavers on the ship, you know, really saw the Africans as property, but they also wanted to make money. And the more people who will survive, the more money they made. So they did some things to ensure that they would survive like um, an hour or two above deck. They would have these big clips that they could chain them onto on the deck itself. Then, of course, they also had suicide nets on the sides of the slave ship because it was so common that the enslaved people would use this opportunity to throw themselves overboard. Um, but yeah, no exercise and the food they're getting is, you know, what we call like gruel, you know, it's, you know, flour, you know, maybe bread at best, rice, stuff like that. I think I've answered all the questions and I don't want to take up any more of Dr. Edwards section. So, all right, well, Nicole, yeah. see any more questions for me? Uh, well, I'll stop there. I have plenty of questions, but thank you, um, Chris. But we'll, um, you know, take a, a pause and we will turn the floor over now to um, Dr. Um, Ned Edwards. But thank you again, Chris and Dr. Ned. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. And, and Chris, thank you for that uh, really wonderful history um, portrayed in such a great way. It, 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 I'm never tired of hearing the story and you, you tell it so, so well and, and bring it home to us. Uh, I really appreciate that. And, and I, I particularly love the way that you talk about dehumanization and then the need for rehumanization. And this next part of the story, and, and uh, I, I don't get to show um, nice uh, movie clips, because um, as I've told these good folks uh, on our panel, um, when Steven Spielberg uh, uh, put his movie together, he did come to Farmington because he knew the Farmington part of the story. And he was driven through Farmington. He was shown all the historical places and uh, all the, the sites of the Underground Railroad. And um, he just shook his head and said, no, I don't think so. So uh, he did not tell this part of the story. So I have the privilege of, of telling this part of the story that really is um, rehumanizing. And uh, the, the question about, um, about uh, the president in the hot seat, uh, and, and Chris, you tell me if I'm wrong, but at least my understanding was that Van Buren had a ship in the New Haven Harbor um, ready to sail back to Cuba because he was going to assume that the the um, the Mendy were were going to be seen as slaves and and given back. Um, is that right to me? Um, but when they were when they were declared free, um, he withdrew that that 
um, that ship and they were um, in need immediately of of being able to live and being able to find a way to get back. And, and the Amistad Committee in New Haven, which had been um, so active and so helpful to them up to this point, really went into to high gear to find a place where they might be able to live, where they might be able to work, where they might be protected and cared for in such a way to rehumanize them uh, and be able to earn money to be able to get back to Sierra Leone. And uh, because Louis Tappan on the Amistad Committee was very, very well connected around the, the entire state, he knew that Farmington was a, a real hub of the Underground Railroad. It was um, a, a, a place that um, welcomed uh, slaves that were trying to get free and uh, folks made it through there very, very quickly and very easily. And he was very familiar with um, three or really four very important players in Farmington. One is Austin Williams, one is um, Samuel Deming and John Treadwell Norton, and then the pastor of the Congregational Church in town, um, Noah Porter. And it was to those people, and they were in, um, they were in conversation um, about making a place for uh, the Mendy, even before they were free. As a matter of fact, we have some letters between Lewis Tappan and Austin Williams that um, discuss the very real possibility that if they are not set free, that they were hatching a plan to be able to break them out of jail and to smuggle them to Canada and to freedom. So these were these were pretty serious uh, uh, men. Um, they were they were not uh, um, fooling around with this. They, it was it was really important that they uh, find a way for these uh, Mendy to be you know, rehumanized. Now Farmington has been uh, lauded by at least one author as a hotbed of radicalism in uh, the 1830s and 40s because of this very strong abolitionist bent. But at the same time, uh, the, the town itself was not completely unanimous in this. And as a matter of fact, they had been uh, the site of what uh, is, is known as the Farmington Riot, where the abolitionists and um, the non-abolitionists got into to quite a match and uh, wanted to, uh, the, the non-abolitionists, the slave, um, the pro-slavery folks wanted to um, the bust out some of the, the slaves that they thought were being held in, in Farmington. So it was not a, a completely friendly place, but Lewis Tappan knew that these men were very reliable and that they would provide for, um, for, uh, for the Mendy in a way that uh, maybe others couldn't. So knowing that there were a number of, of uh, somewhat dissenters in town, the Mendy were brought by train at night to the station in Berlin and brought in carriages from the station to Farmington. And uh, they were brought in on, on a particular day so that the first day that they were there, they came to the Congregational Church for Sunday services. And as part of the rehumanization, which was so important to the pastor Noah Porter and to these other men, Noah Porter had Singbe Pie and the, um, I believe Fune and, um, and Margru, if not others, sit in his family pew, a place where uh, Africans had not sat before, uh, even free blacks had not uh, sat in his pew before. And that was his public way of declaring their humanity and the friendship that he expected the congregation to have with them. 
So they were prepared to, uh, to bring them, to befriend them. And the, the gentleman who um, Lewis Tappan knew, um, Austin Williams, um, was a, a, a person who was one of the conductors of the Underground Railroad, was very, very well connected. Um, they first lived in a store, and that was Samuel Deming's store right across the street from the church. But the quarters in that store were very, very cramped. So Austin Williams spoke, and, and this was one of the great aspects of uh, this relationship that built, was that in, in those days, the ways in which churches dealt in mission terms with people from other countries was a very, usually a very paternalistic um, white savior type of, uh, of attitude. The idea that we knew what was best for them and we're going to give them what they, we think they need. That was very different than the way in which Noah Porter and Austin Williams and Samuel Deming and John Treadwell Norton dealt with the Mendy. They knew their intelligence, they knew their ability to negotiate, and everything became a discussion and discovering what it is that the Mendy needed and wanted. So they wanted a place to be able to sleep on their own. So Austin Williams built for them a dormitory on Main Street. Uh, it's now, and, and you can still go there, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a private residence, but uh, you can see it from the street. It was made into a carriage house later on, but a place that um, was available to them that they could call theirs, that was private, they um, were fed meals made by the people of the church in, uh, in Deming's store. And, um, you know, even though they had been in the United States for three years, uh, they were not really fond of the cooking that was being done for them by the women of the church. Now, we might argue with that, some of us today. But uh, they, they, they had some, some tastes that they wanted. So in discussion, how could, how could we help them to be able to, uh, to cook and to have some food that would be much more palatable and much more familiar to them? Well, Farmington is named Farmington for a reason, for all the farming that is done there. So just on the other side of the Farmington River, which was just down the street from Deming's store and from Austin Williams Carriage House, they gave them 15 acres of land where they could do their own farming and growing of their own food and allow them to, to cook and to um, feel as though they were contributing and, uh, and to live and, and, and work and do what, what it is that uh, rehumanized them. Um, as you pointed out uh, so well, Chris, that um, Sigbe was a farmer and a number of them knew farming. So that was a, a natural opportunity for them. In that uh, Deming store, they also were um, taught English reading and writing and um, were given time to uh, do gymnastics on John Treadwell Norton's front lawn. Um, they were very, very uh, um, agile and uh, loved to, to exercise and to do gymnastics. They would put on shows for the children. And one of the ways in which they raised the money for um, hiring a ship to take them back to Sierra Leone was that they would go down to the Farmington River and get on a canal boat. That canal boat would sometimes take them one way to Plainville, sometimes uh, the other way up here to Simsbury, and then even farther on to the Connecticut River where they'd get on to um, another boat and head up to Northampton. And they would um, do a number of things. They would recite, they would uh, read scripture, they would sing, they were amazing singers, they would do gymnastics. And uh, every time that they, they did this, the church where they were performing. It was usually a church 
um, would take an offering and um, that offering got put into the, uh, the, the Amistad committee's uh, coffers and set aside as a way of helping them raise that money for, uh, for their passage back. So they spent um, a number of, of months, nine months in Farmington, helping and, and befriending the, uh, the folks around. It was not always sweetness and light. There were those incidents where some of the townspeople would uh, have a little too much to drink and want to come down and, and pick a fight with these Africans. And um, Singbe, as a as an amazing leader and as a cool-headed uh, person, was usually able to uh, dissipate some of that uh, that situation. And uh, John Treadwell Norton and others were uh, were very helpful in that way as as well. Um, it was very important for Noah Porter, the pastor of the church that the Mende be educated. He was an educator. He had gone to Yale. He was a lecturer at Yale. His son became a professor at Yale and his daughter, of course, uh, Sarah Porter, uh, became the, the founder and uh, first head of Miss Porter's school. But two years before that, before she founded Miss Porter's school, um, Porter's was founded in 1843. In 1841, Noah Porter agreed to and wanted to bring Margrew into his home because he knew that Sarah Porter had a penchant for wanting to teach. And this was um, something that uh, he thought she could be particularly good at with, with Margrew. So uh, for those nine months, Margrew had a personal tutor in Sarah Porter, and Sarah Porter did a wonderful job. When it was time for, uh, for Margrew to choose a, a, an Americanized name, as sometimes is done, um, she chose her name to be Sarah Margrew after Sarah Porter. And as was pointed out uh, earlier, when she went back to uh, to Sierra Leone, she went to the mission school that was started by the missionaries that went back with them. She continued her education, then came back to the United States, uh, went to Oberlin College, and then went back to Sierra Leone and became a teacher at that, uh, at that missionary school. So the, 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 the ways and the influences of the Mendy experience here was uh, was really overwhelming and, and uh, had some, some far reaches. Now, for nine months, as we noted, uh, they were educated, they, they raised money, and finally in November of uh, 1841, they had just about enough money. They had, high, they had uh, amassed enough to be able to uh, put a down payment on the Gentleman, which was the ship that would take them back to Sierra Leone. And uh, there was announced that there would be a final farewell service at the church in Farmington. And this was um, quite a, a service. It, uh, it packed the church. And uh, even in November, what they had to do was to open all the windows in the church so that the people who were standing outside, five, six, seven deep outdoors, um, could hear uh, the service, the prayers, the thanksgivings, the, uh, the singing that was done by the church choir as well as by the Mendy. Uh, Singbe Pie uh, himself, was in the pulpit and preached for almost an hour in Mendy so that he was preaching to his people. And uh, the, the, the folks in the congregation did not know what he said, but they knew the, the look on the faces of the Mendy and how important those words were. And uh, it was a, a very moving experience. There was a, a collection taken at that service that raised $1,400, which uh, back then is, is quite an amount. 
and that amount was um, went over the top in terms of what they needed in order to uh, hire the gentleman to go back to to Sierra Leone. So that was done. They they left the, the um, left Farmington, uh, but not without leaving a huge impression on the people, on the church, and on the experience of what it means to be in relationship with people who are very different. And that aspect, uh, that relational aspect um, is, is something that uh, has continued on in the church. Uh, one, of the, one of the side uh, stories that took place is that um, James Pennington, who was uh, the, a, a former slave, um, a freed slave, uh, who was the pastor of the first black church in, in Hartford, uh, was brought in and, and befriended and had, became a, a, a good friend of Noah Porter in Farmington. Um, to the extent that they began exchanging pulpits, which was something that uh, was not seen in the 1840s. Um, and he was a great friend to the Mendy and, and, and helped them very much. And that relationship with, um, with the church in Hartford uh, and the Farmington Church continued for many, many, many years, and I believe it still does. So that's another, another aspect that, uh, that continues. But that is, uh, that is the gist of the story um, in Farmington for the time they were there for those nine months. But as I said, the, the, what took place there uh, really had ripple effects into the future, helping, to people, helping people to understand what it means to befriend, what it means to be a missionary in a very different way than the paternalistic way that um, churches had been missionaries in the past. And it was Noah Porter who started the first American Board of Foreign Missions in his living room in 1810. So he was very interested and already uh, set up to want to have a relationship with people from other countries. So um, that was something that, uh, that also uh, played a part in this. I'm gonna, gonna stop there. I've been talking a bit and wondering if there are questions about, uh, about this part of the story because it's not part of the story in the movie and, and uh, um, Chris, I don't know how much of the story, um, discovering Amistad, of this story, discovering Amistad uh, shares at this point. Well, it really depends. I, I can do up to eight week, uh, eight hours of programming. <laughs> I did an eight week program in New Haven for the Boys and Girls Club. So we got really into the details. But one thing I wanted to ask you, um, was this, the, was it the Farmington abolitionist that helped Antonio escape? Uh, just to remind people, Antonio was the uh, enslaved of the captain, Ramon Ferrer, of the Amistad. And Ramon Ferrer was killed during the rebellion, and the court ruled that Antonio was legally enslaved because he was not part of that Amistad African group. Um, and I know abolitionists helped him escape to Canada. I just don't know if it was the Farmington abolitionists. And I don't know that the answer to that question. That is a fascinating question. Most of, as you, you know, the Farmington was the, the hub. Um, it was, you know, kind of the center. So most folks went through Farmington, but I don't know whether that, uh, whether they had a direct uh, relation to that. We should, um, we should also, that reminds me, we should talk about Fune a bit um, because he is the one, uh, Mendy, who did not make it back to Africa, and uh, and there are have always been some very very um, difficult questions about uh, Fune, who drowned in the Farmington Basin, the on the in the Farmington River, in the swim basin. Um, he was reported to be a very strong swimmer, but so it it seemed as though. Uh, Drowning was not a part of, uh, of his character, but there was also talk of the fact that he 
was very depressed and uh, did not know whether he would be getting back to his homeland, which is what he really wanted to do. And so there has been speculation about whether his, his death was um, by accident, whether it was um, other causes, whether it was something that uh, was, was beyond his control or not. Uh, but his graveside, his, his uh, grave was given to him by one of the local church members, and that grave is in Riverside Cemetery on Garden Street in Farmington. And it has been the site for many, many years of, uh, it is always a place where Sierra Leonean dignitaries need to come. And it has been the site of a number of different prayer services, of remembrances, of the pouring of libations, of services of, of Christian origin, of, of Muslim origin, of, of um, ancestral worship, just as a remembrance. Um, so that's a very, very powerful and sacred place uh, in that cemetery. Part of the story, um, Dr. Edwards, where you were um, having those primary source letters of, a, of a, a potential plot, you know, on how to, you know, break the captives, you know, out of, you know, prison, because guilty was going to be a death sentence, That's you know, right. so in, in hearing that, and it also, you know, and, and speaks to the, I guess, how complicit the, you know, the government was also in the you know, in the slave trade as well, where the, you know, the three-fifths compromise, a variety of state, you know, compromises to the, you know, compromise the fugitive slave law of 1850. But just, you know, hearing that part about that potential, you know, plot of how, you know, it's like a, a underground resistance is, is going on and the ability, the desire to say, hey, we're going to um, take on the government, you know, as a potential remedy, you know, on how to do right, you know, in this situation. So you're obviously sharing a lot of inside information and insight that is not, you know, generally known. But, you know, the fact we mentioned having that letter where that even is coming up for discussion was like, you know, wow, that was a, a pretty powerful, um, you know, point that is being shared there. These men were serious. Yeah. And then, and, uh, and the moral courage uh, of so many folks, including uh, Singbei, including the Mendi, including Margru, um, is, is very evident. Right. That actually makes me think of like John Brown up in Torrington, you know, taking the, the fight down the Harper's Ferry there, you know, in Virginia to the Federal Armory and talking about being serious. And it's like, yeah, this is, if this is where it's going to have to go to get, you know, the government's attention as to say, like, you know, this has to stop. Then, you know, there was the, the willingness to, to do so. But that yeah, was, um, you know, I was quite a, um, you know, great component, you know, of the history, you know, of there as well. And the part you mentioned about the giving of the 15 acres, you know, so it definitely made me think of, you know, the restitution of 40 acres and a mule. <laughs> and perhaps how much of a of a difference that could have made, you know, in the lives of of freed slaves, and just being able to have that type of, you know, um, restitution or or reparation, you know, obviously um, instead of just having to be placed in the midst of a competitive society and still having to make a way, which um which are able to do, but just hearing that part of saying, given that that gift, you know, that package of the fifteen acres just to be able to have that type of peace you know to be able to do so that was another um phenomenal part yeah that's one of the um a very uh agreed upon reason that reconstruction failed is that ultimately is a failure of land redistribution and there was in the beginning an opportunity right because all of the plantation land had been confiscated and there was an opportunity to redistribute it and it happened a little bit here and there and then stopped and a lot of a lot of people think that really determined the failure you're right of reconstruction and that becomes the that issue of of compensation is uh how can i say it was a a, a, a robust area for slavery but globally you know, so when you talk about the um, Caribbean and why it took so long, 
the slave trade was able to end, I believe, 18, you know, 07, the transatlantic slave trade. But how much longer does it take for slavery, you know, to end? And a lot of that is always a, a question of compensation and not compensation for the slaves, but compensation for the slaveholders, you know, because slavery was legal. And so now how are they going to be literally be compensated? Okay, if you want to end slavery, then you know Britain just finished paying off the loan that they had to take out, you know, to pay back, you know, the um slaveholders, you know, and to agree to end slavery pretty much in the Caribbean islands. And so that point of compensation, nothing going to the slaves was a or the descendants of the slaves was a, a common you know theme and so the point that that america didn't do any different does not any thing out of the norm from any of the other you know countries that participated you know in the slave trade as well so whether it be the british the dutch the you know the spanish the portuguese that issue of compensation was a a major a major thing the, so the freed freed men at the time freed women were just pretty much left, you know, to keep that hierarchy, the social hierarchy and economic hierarchy remained in place all over the um, Western hemisphere as a result. So yeah, that compensation and now people are talking about reparations to this day, you know, and that's still a, a major topic, you know, of, of how to make right, you know, for much of the injustice and the inequity that still exists, you know, in society as a result. So there's, there's, there's a lot to unpack. <laughs> You know, and, and, and what, as what you mentioned, what has been Nikosi, discussed. reparations did happen for the British government giving to enslavers. So when people say right. reparations couldn't happen, well, it went in in England anyway, in the British government. It went to the enslavers who lost their slaves, but no government has ever done it the other way. Yeah, well, yeah. that's not completely true. The U.S. gave reparations to Asian American or Japanese Americans that's then, right. so. Yeah, so this is still a major, 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 um, major talk, and so, and it's 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 good, and there's it's a lot of um, like I say, a lot to unpack, you know, and what has been shared, you know, this evening, even the, the fact, um, Dr. Ned, what you talked about about allowing, you know, the the men day, uh, men and women to have their pew, you know, at the church, like you can have my seat, not just to say come into my church. But you need to sit up top, you know, in the rafters or sit in the back somewhere. You could come into the church, but don't expect to sit, you know, up with us. And so I'm sure that probably made a lot of people uncomfortable, you know, at the time, because it would take a lot of people out of their, their comfort zone. But I think that willingness, you know, to um, to lend a hand, that willingness to, you know, to be, you know, I guess, straightforward and forthwith is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenging, you know, because it makes a lot of people um uncomfortable you know when you open up you know open your hand or open your heart you know in that sense as well so that was another um, powerful point well and, and and i also need to to be truthful in this because you know all of this is is fraught with a lot of anxiety and a lot of uh, of bias and uh, and one of the the unfortunate stories at least in in my mind is that um, within six months of the Mendy sailing back to Sierra Leone, the Farmington Church uh, voted that no one was allowed to invite anyone into their pews to sit Absolutely. anymore. Oh, so, I mean, that was a direct, that was a direct shot at, um, at what uh, Noah Porter had done. Um, so it, you know, it, it wasn't all sweetness and light. Um, it still was, was tough. And I do see um, a, a question in the chat here about what impact the Mendy had on the people of Farmington and surrounds. Um, there, Farmington was, for the most part, a very abolitionist um, town. Um, but there, there was, you know, the pendulum always swings back a little bit. So there was, uh, there was some reaction uh, in the town of Farmington afterwards. Right. All right. Nice. And there's a, another question here also, Chris, and it's in response to the um, the map that you showed of the um, of the slave ships with the bubbles. And so, as um, Nicole is asking, um, is do you know of an interactive map or a version of a map? 
that perhaps continues past the movement of slave ships to where the human beings were taken beyond the ports. And I think that speaks to where were, you know, African captives, how far out were they, you know, dispersed, um, you know, coming off the slave ships. And so I think that's, you know, speaking to that. That I don't know. I think that was harder to track because I'll put the website I got it from in chat, um, slavevoyages.org, but that's taken from only the known, you know, slave voyages. There were, I'm sure, tons and tons, a huge percentage that were unknown slave voyages. And that's just ones that there are records of in some port, while the, the movement of people on land wasn't tracked in the same way. Right. I know I've seen some interactive maps for the Underground Railroad, but I don't know if I've seen them for the dispersion of the slave trade on land in that same way. I just think it's harder to track, but um, I don't know of anyone personally, but if you find one, please send it to me. Right. And I think, you know, that just also speaks, you know, to, um, I guess what we call today, you know, the African diaspora. So, you know, um, I like sports. And so sometimes, like I said, when I'm watching um, soccer and I see like the Ecuadorian team and you see how many, obviously, people of African um, ethnicity heritage are there. So it lets me know, OK, there was a um, slaves were brought to Ecuador. OK, I see Colombia and you see that. And so I think it kind of speaks to that you know, point. And so um, David Ortiz, you know, Dominican, you know, Republic or, or Puerto Rico. And then obviously you have, you know, what was happening in Haiti, but that's all over the, the Caribbean. You know, you see that I'm um, blending, you know, of whether it's the Native American people, whether it's European um, descent or what they would call the Amerindian people in the Caribbean, plus the, um, the European um, um, component. And then you have the African um, component as well. And so you see there's that that big blending with the Creole society. So yeah, but you see that the diffusion, the cultural um, diffusion, especially throughout the, the Caribbean is not, slavery is not always discussed, I think, so much in Central America, you know, in South America, outside of Brazil. But, um, you know, you see people from Guyana and Suriname and, you know, French um, Guyana, all the way, you know, to, to, to Belize, and you see, but you just see the, 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 um, the, 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 the amount of, of mix and color, and so you know that there's been a, an infusion uh, of blood from a variety of different places, and so I don't, I guess to say we don't always grasp the, 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 the breadth, you know, this, how broad and how big the slave trade truly was that, that bubble map that interactive map really puts a bit of a, a, a eye to it as I said this is really how many ships you know were crossing the Atlantic you know with cargoes of 200 300 400 500 people going to south oh and, and then it, it's it, it's pretty eye-opening and I think that's probably where that question comes from It's very eye-opening. And I, I'm sorry. And I was just looking, too, of the Clotilda. And that was the book Zora Neale Hurston just wrote about the um the interview that she had of, like, the last slave who came. And that was, you know, during the, um, during the, towards the end of the Civil War. And they just found the boat, you know, I believe in, like, the um Alabama River, if I'm not mistaken. So that was the, the very last slave ship has been located that brought, um, African captives to America illegally, pretty much all the way up to the to the end of the Civil War. And her book, um, Barracoon, is the the interview that she has with that last um that last slave who who made it, you know, who was brought to America illegally. And then the whole town that they um created and founded, you know, that's still in existence, you know, today. But there is 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 a, a lot to to unpack. And I like the part of, you know, the Amistad is the part of history where, you know, to end slavery, it, it shows what it took. You know, it was going to take a fight. It was going to take force. It was going to literally be um, to the death, you know, and there's a, a whole litany of slave rebellions, um, but there's not necessarily that history of the, the true success of people gaining their 
freedom back and the opportunity not you know to say i was free for a few hours or a few days or no one's laws or rules applied to me but the fact that said that i won you know my freedom and so you mentioned that um slave ship i think you said it was the creole you know you have the amistad i mean the haitian rebellion that scared the heck out of you know uh of america and the world and that was a, a big um reason for the ending of the of the transatlantic slave trade was the haitian re um, rebellion america didn't want any parts of that and so it's it's the the force that's come that was needed and then what it took no compromise no negotiation it was gonna have to be you know to the death you know in order to for a a, a slave to be gain their god-given right um, to be free. And as it was going to have to be no other way, you could run away, you know, in that sense, but there wasn't any negotiation about, Hey man, you're not, you're not treating me right. There was no morality in any of this. You weren't appealing to anyone's hearts, to anyone's emotions. And so you see it, you see the work that, that was needed and the, the fight that it took. And then the teamwork that was also came as a response you know, to meet the need, you know, of the, of the people as well. So it's just, you know, been um, phenomenal. And I don't know if anyone else in the audience has any um, questions or any, you know, comments that they wish to, that they wish to give. Yep. That's the book. I see it. Um, Barracoon at Zora Neale, um, Zora Neale Hurston, you know, as well. And so, you know, we see it. It's happening today. Um, Brian Flores, and he's had to do a class action lawsuit you know, with the NFL and trying to, what does it take to get, you know, a voice to be heard, you know, okay, injustice, enough is enough. So it's not about picking up a, a, a weapons to fight in that sense, but it says that we're going to take you to court and we're going to take the, um, take the, the fight to the courts then, and then we'll have it there. And at least to have these conversations to be put out um, in the public. And so you see the, you see the response, but you know, I appreciate, you know, obviously, um, you two, uh, Dr. Ned and Chris coming to, to share with us um, this evening. Obviously, it's a, a very historically um, relevant topic. And anytime you want to talk about freedom, anytime you want to talk about injustice, anytime you want to talk about teamwork, you know, and what it took to, um, you know, for um, the Amistad men and women and children to be um, set free, to win their freedom, to fight for their freedom, then to legally win their freedom, and then to have to endure to be able to try to make it home and then still have their own, you know, variety of situations occur there as well. But this is a, a, um, a portion of Oh, Bill asked if Sengbei's Seng sermon has ever been translated into English. Well, it's never. It was never written down. He he spoke contemporaneously, and um, he spoke longer in Mendi than he did in English. And the only record we have of that service was from the reporters that were uh, at the church and and taking notes. So they took notes on what he said in English, but he but no one knew what he was saying in uh, in Mendi. So. Uh, so that was difficult. I would imagine Kobe would have rejoined the British Navy at that point. So he was probably not translating for him. Yeah. What, can you um, repeat also the name of that cemetery that you mentioned? Is that grave site? Is it like you said, I know you said it's, it's, it's um, visited frequently. So I'm assuming like there's a tombstone, like it's marked, I'm assuming to be able to go and see it. There is a, a, um, a grave marker. Uh, it, 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 you have to know where to go. And uh, let me put in a little plug for the Stanley Whitman House and their relationship with the Farmington Historical Society. The Stanley Whitman House is on High Street in Farmington. Um, they have a great collection of uh, local memorabilia and um, have all the information about the Amistad in Farmington. And uh, they can direct folks to the um, to the grave site. It's a small marker, but it's the original one that uh, is from um, 1841 and uh, has uh, Fune right there. Um, but because all the grave markers in Riverside Cemetery are small, um, you have to know where you're going to look for it and find it.
There actually are a number, um, a couple of the Amistad Africans died imprisoned in New Haven. You know, they just gotten off a boat where they were dehydrated and starving. So some of them didn't survive. So a couple of them are buried at, um, I think it's Grove, Grove Street, Street Cemetery, Cemetery in New Haven. Right. And then there is a statue to Sangbei PA on the site um, of the prison in New Haven, right off the town green that you can go visit. It's on Church Street. Church. Uh, Amistad, Discovering Amistad's office is, is right next to that. Oh. If you're ever looking for the boat, we move around. So just right. check our website, discoveringamistad.org. I got to plug that. Um, to see where we're, we're putting a tracker on there so you can see where the boat is. Mm, that's great. I, I wanted to say what you're saying, Dr. Ned, when you said they were like wondering about the depression or the, you know, if there was some other things. And I, I just want to say like that life spirit, like that, that depression wasn't there, but it's, it's always hard to put yourself in someone else's, you know, shoes at a time, you know, such as that and what truly you know, could have been and would have been, you know, obviously the, you know, the the hurts of the heart or what have you. But I know like in the back of my head, I was like, no way was there going to be a, a, a depression or, you know, that type of taking of, of his own life. But, you know, as you can, what they say, you can never say never because you truly never know what we don't know. know what can and will or what, you know, has, you know, has happened. So, and so I, I hope I would like to find out a little bit more, you know, I guess just talking about, you know, the cemetery um, components, that's something I would definitely um, like to be able to see. This is great. I go, we did some tours down in South Carolina, you know, it took my family, uh, we were in a Myrtle Beach, we went down to Charleston and did, you know, a tour, one of the rice plantations that were down there, and you still see like the slave burial grounds that are there and you can still go into the backwoods of the from the tours and you know you can see these types of things and so it, it invokes like you say a lot of you know thought a lot of you know memory and just trying to almost like wow you know just to to, to survive and then to to overcome you know and then to be able just to be able to endure I guess that type of resilience you know that it truly did take that it's just very very difficult to fathom I lived in, in North Carolina for 10 years, um, and uh, I was uh, really interested to discover the number. There's, there is a, a large Sierra Leone population um, down there because of uh, Mendy had been, Mendy, uh, those who had been kidnapped as slaves brought to South Carolina to work in those rice fields. Yep, and that's amazing. And it speaks to the expertise almost, because even to make rice work, you know, to get it to grow, it takes a lot of expertise, you know, to be able to do that. So you talk about from the rice, talk about to the um, sugar, you know, and things, just the, the expertise that was needed to be able to make, you know, these crops, cash crops, you know, successful and to keep it, you know, to make it profitable. And so, you know, it's a lot that is um, spoken about because, again, the, the humanity of the of the captive, you know, because the slave is the economic term, but the the humanity of the of the captive is often, you know, overlooked. You said it too, like when you said black is synonymous with a slave. I think you said it right when you say talk about the term a freed slave. You know, it might not even be a a slave, but just the just how intertwined those two terms, you know, have um become. And so and that's something that I'm actually going to share. I'm teaching an um, African American, you know, experience history class at Bloomfield High School, and um, you know, um, Chris, that's where you are at the 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 point of talking about, you know, the West African kingdoms, you know, right now, and then talking about dehumanization and trying to paint a picture like, yo, these are people, you know, and so we're, we're talking about that. So that's something I'm gonna be sure you know, that I mentioned, and just to see how those two terms are almost always synonymous with black and slave. And they talk about the a freed um, slave or free slave. I think that's how it is, how you went. But yeah, I appreciate, you know, obviously you guys appreciate your time um, and definitely appreciate just the the, the, um, the expertise and just the, the story, you know, of being able to put so much more of a human face you know, to all of this. So I was um, just for myself, you know, it's very um, just beneficial. Um, we see that, um, yep, Lindsay shared the resources for further info on tonight's 
um, topic. So it's a great list. Um, please check it out. Um, Chris, I was in touch. I think I mentioned to you about um, Simsbury. They do their equity week at the high school. And so I'll get some information to you because I know you say you might be um, interested in presenting, you know, for that as well. So I'll get that information to you. I reached out um, to one of the um, organizers of that. And so Sounds great. Like, yep, so I'll get you that information as well. So, you know, that's a cool thing, be able to network, you know, and just be able to, um, you know, to make it even bigger, you know, just to reach out because it's a, it's a great portion of history, you know, that definitely um, can, it was not going to get old regardless of, of the timing of it. And it's not going to get old. So it's great to keep these um, parts of history alive, you know, and, and it keeps things and makes it relative to how, you know, to today as well. So 